Okay. So today we have uh, Kat Balligan from the University of Texas El Paso with us. Kat is a A licensed USSF A licensed coach. She's also been a college coach for the past 10 years, uh, including six years as a head coach. She spent five years at Texas Southern in Houston, and then last year went to the University of Texas El Paso and just finished her first year there. Uh, they made it to the conference tournament for the first time in four years during her first year. Uh, Kat has actually never missed a conference tournament in her coaching career and is hoping to continue that trait. Uh, she's also been a ODP coach for the last nine years and is speaking uh, today with us about how to help in your recruiting for colleges. And so she's going to go ahead and take the presentation and we'll let her go from here. And then there'll be questions at the end where we can go through some of the things that people have sent in that are interested about college. Thank hey, you, Kat. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Um, grateful for this opportunity. think this is a great time to be spending um, to learn about all sorts of different things, whether it's college recruiting or the process or the mental side of things. I think with everything going on, this is a great opportunity to get out and um, talk a little bit about some things that I might know a little bit more than others about. Um, as a college coach. So thanks for having me, Garrett. Thanks to South Texas for inviting me and I'm excited to dive in. So with that being said, um, I thought the most important thing to start with are kind of the different leagues. Obviously, I think everybody has heard about the NCAA, um, maybe a little bit about the NAIA and maybe a little bit about um, JUCO colleges. So here's some just basic information about each of them um, and, and kind of how that plays in. Obviously, you can see there's three different uh, divisions within the NCAA. Um, within the NAI, there's actually also two divisions. I didn't list any of the division threes, so that's just the first division. Um, and then the JUCOs there at the bottom with that. And so as you can see, um, the athletic and academic portions, um, I talked about those a little bit, but just to dive in a little bit on this is really division one, uh, division two and NAIA schools and JUCO colleges can all give athletic and academic scholarships. Uh, the only one different for that is division three. Now, that is not to say that everybody has the same amount of money and that's where it differs drastically between even division one schools. Some may be fully funded, which is 14 scholarships, um, whereas others might only have one or two. Um, and division two and NAIA and JUCOs are all the same with when it comes to that. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about why the academics is super important with that. Um, so as you see in terms of training and playing, all of these programs play in the fall, like their championship season is during the fall. Uh, and then what you can see there is, again, Division Three has very, very limited spring seasons. And that will really um, be a huge difference between some of the NAIA program, I mean, some of the Division um, NCAA programs. Uh, the other thing that's super important to kind of recognize about this, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get to NAIA, but uh, there's a lot of reduced entrance requirements for NAIA. So moving on, diving in a little bit to the NCAA. In the last year or two, they have really decided, hey, we need to slow down the recruiting process. And I, for one, definitely agree with that. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing in five years, so I can't imagine that an eighth grader knows what's best for them. In addition, coaches change typically aren't at a location more than five to six years. Now, there's some that are there less than that. There are some that are more there more than that. Um, so that definitely depends as well. But if you went there because of a coach or a program, a coach or a program can drastically change between when you're in eighth grade and when you're a freshman. Now, do I think Stanford's going to drop from the top to the bottom? No, I, I don't see that happening. However, um, if you're choosing between some of the same main mid majors or some of the same power fives, um, a lot can change within that. So I think it's a good decision from the NCAA 
to slow down the recruiting process. And their hope is that there isn't as many transfers along the way. So with some of those new rule changes is no communication with a coach until June 15th of the prospective student's sophomore year. So what does that mean in layman terms? It means I, as the college coach, can't reach out to any um, player, or even if you reach out to me, I can't contact you back. So if you call me, I still can't call you back. If you email me, I still can't email you back. Now, there are some rules that kind of change a little bit, and we'll talk about those and how that um, can change a little bit. The same goes for official and unofficial visits. Before, you could take an official visit um, in your junior and your senior year, and that's still possible. However, you cannot take any unofficial visits until August 1st of your junior year. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that plays into the timeline of recruiting and that sort of thing, but that's an important one as well. Now, this is where it does change a little bit. Um, you can receive brochures for camps and questionnaires at any time. So a freshman or a sophomore can receive brochures and camp information as well as questionnaires. So whereas before, like sometimes people would say, oh, they're just asking me to camp because they are trying to raise money. Now that might not be the case. They might actually be reaching out to get your information to see if you are interested in their school. So um, it is a little bit harder in those first years. And, and again, we'll talk about some of the timeline a little bit later. Coaches can still talk with your club coaches or your high school coaches before your junior year. However, we aren't allowed to tell them where you fit in our prospect list. So I can't say, hey, Susie looks like she's, she's a forward and she's gonna score a lot of goals for us and we're really excited to pursue her in her junior year. Now I can't say that. Now what I could say is, hey, we have seen Susie play. What are your thoughts on Susie? Get some of his thoughts or her thoughts. We can also ask, um, what are their interests? What are you looking at? Uh, would a college such as myself be something that they would be interested in? Um, are they excited to move far away or close to home? So all of those questions. Um, and so I think it's gonna be super important as we talk about the timeline that you're in connection with your club coach and that they're telling you all of the information. Because sometimes high school or club coaches hold back some information based on certain things. So make sure with your high school or your club coach that you have a really good relationship there. Okay, moving on. So, like I said, you're still only allowed five official visits. Now, with that being said, you can take those in your junior year. You can't take more. So if you have seven or eight schools on June 15th say, hey, we, you would be somebody we would be looking to on August 1st have a official visit with, you're going to have to narrow that down. You won't be able to take all of those. Now, you can still take as many unofficial visits as you want in your junior and senior year. So some of that will have to happen. And unfortunately, it used to be you could take unofficial visits in your sophomore year. You can no longer do that. So it, it really condensed that time period, trying to push it back a little bit. With that being said, if you are a junior or a senior, a coach can now talk to you on your day of an event. We don't have to wait till the end of the event. And this was a major rules change because um, NAIA schools used to be able to do this, D2 schools used to be able to do this, and so the only people that weren't allowed were Division I. However, this rule has changed here recently, but it is when the day is over. So we can't come talk to you before your game. We can't come talk to you at halftime. We can't come talk to you, you get subbed out, you're putting ice on your, your foot, we still can't talk to you. Technically, if this was completely done right, we still can't talk to you until your coach has released you for the day. Um, and sometimes that gets a little gray area and what is the day over mean. 
Um, but it's, it's really the best if once your coach has released you and you want to talk to a college coach, that is the best time to do it. Social media has changed the landscape as well. Um, so I'm not always perfect on this, um, but you are allowed to like and retweet things. You can do any of that at any point in time. If there's a school that you're interested in, you want to retweet something, go for it. If there's a goal that they do or something that they're doing that you like, go for it. All of those things are definitely allowed. Coaches, on the other hand, can't do all of that. Again, going back to your junior year, there's some significant restrictions. And then once your junior year, we can't, for example, retweet that you verbally committed. So just making sure that um, we're sticking to those. Last thing for NCAA schools, everyone in the NCAA has to register with the NCAA Eligibility Center and complete the full process. Now, at the end of the process, you will have to send in an official transcript with all of your classes saying that you graduated. Some people choose to wait to complete this NCAA Eligibility Center. I suggest you don't do that. For one, you need an NCAA Eligibility Center number to go on any official visit at an NCAA school. For two, there's a lot going on when you're graduating. You don't want to have to go in and submit your amateurism, or you don't want to have to go in and make sure all of your information is updated. So my best advice is if you're looking at NCAA schools, do it then, and then you won't have to worry about it. You'll have to submit a transcript at around the beginning of your junior year, and you should be good to go. So that is my suggestion there. Okay, diving now into NAIA programs. There's a lot of similarities between NAIA and NCAA. However, I think NAIA gets pushed back a little bit um, in terms of, oh, they're not as good or they're whatever, pride takes over. Uh, I worked as a GA for an NAA program, and it's the only opportunity I have ever had to play for a national championship. And it was an amazing opportunity. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. So um, I have a soft spot. Yes, I work for an NCAA school now, but I do have a, a little bit of a soft, soft spot for NAIA programs. They do have fewer enrollment standards. They have flexible rules and regulations to help with the process. Um, and this is kind of where it comes in for me, like they have the smaller classroom sizes and increased focus on academics. Like they're really focused about the academics and growing individuals. And so if school is something that maybe isn't as easy for you or English, English is a second language or you're super competitive and you're super academic, these are really good places for you to look because you have the opportunity to, like I said, go for a national championship. I think the other thing that happens at NAIA programs is there's not as much of a discre discrepancy among programs. Within the NCAA Division I, like we talked about, there is over 300 programs. At the NAI level, there's only about 180. Yes, that's still a big number. However, if you really break it down money-wise, the top 50 schools in Division I have a significant amount of money more than the rest of the schools. And it significantly drops once you get to probably about 150 and then again at 200. So with that being said, um, the money is so much closer. So in the NAIA, at good NAIA programs, you have a real shot at a national championship. And I think that um, for those that are competitive it is something that is a really good opportunity and oppor like something to significantly think about. Okay, so moving on to JUCOs or NJCAA. Um, they typically have much larger rosters. Again, going back to the first slide, they only are two-year programs. Um, and so it's a really good opportunity for players that are non-qualifiers or qualifiers. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit. But if you have su sustained an injury 
during your junior or your senior year and there's a school that you're really interested in or a few schools and they just now are not on the radar, maybe this is a, a really good opportunity. Not just jumping into something because it's the next best thing. Um, going to a JUCO, getting the opportunity to play quite a bit and, and get better over your course of your time and then submit that into being able to play after that. Um, if you struggle in school, uh, JUCOs are really set up to help people that have struggled. So it's a really good opportunity to boost your GPA, to get good grades in those first couple of years of classes. Another really good opportunity for JUCOs. If you need more time to mature, for example, you have um, and this isn't just mature in terms of academically, this is in terms of if you are coming out of high school and you have um, graduated early, you are so smart that you've missed classes, I mean years, and you're graduating early, maybe you need time to socially mature. JUCOs are a great option for that. Um, it gives you an opportunity to socially come to the level to be able to go out and uh, be successful at a, a four-year institution while still continuing to be a really good opportunity to grow as a, as a soccer player and make sure you're the best that you can be. Um, the other couple of really good options are if you've had family or social issues, recruiting your social, I mean, your recruiting process. Again, everybody's process is going to be different. Everybody's journey is going to be different. And there's a lot of things we can't control. And so if death in the family or sickness in the family has really taken havoc over the last couple of years and your family wasn't able to, for say, put the money into something um, or they weren't able to help you or you weren't able to play soccer during that time, this is a really good option. The other thing with that is it can be a really good option. And I know we'll get to this question a little bit later, but it can also be a really good option for players who are coming from smaller locations. If you're in a smaller club or aren't getting seen, if you go to a good JUCO, they will help you get seen. Um, and again, it's not a perfect option um, for everybody, but it is a really good option that I think sometimes because of pride or, um, oh, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. And, and that's only for those mess up football players or baseball players or foot, um, basketball players. Like, no, this is a, a real option. We actually brought in someone this year that we think will um, be a starter for, for us from a JUCO. So I think it's a really good option. Um, and I think more people should take a look at it. Okay, so those are the three different areas. Um, I thought it would be really good time right now to kind of talk about how do I see COVID-19 affecting the recruiting process um, because we are in a totally different atmosphere than anybody has ever seen. This is unprecedented times um, and a lot of change and a lot of adaptation are happening. So with that being said, NCAA has pushed back the recruiting schedule. I think this will even delay the recruiting schedule within itself. Again, going back to our own program, and I can't talk too much about it because of NCAA rules, but within our own program, um, we were hoping to have a certain number of juniors ready to commit by a certain deadline. And that deadline, because we haven't been able to see them over the last couple of weeks, and then because of the way this is happening, probably into the summertime, we haven't been able to recruit um, that will change and that will delay some of those timelines. So I think being flexible in this, um, and, and I think that's another reason why it's really important to think about all of the options and not just, oh, well, I've got to go to this school and it's got to be at this division and it's got to be blah, 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 whatever your ideal is. Yes, you still want to shoot for the moon, um, but there are a lot of good options that could be a better fit. So I think being flexible with within the, what your picture looks like is gonna be super important. I know a couple of things in terms of test scores being changed or academic standards within high schools are all over the board within this. And so I think the NCAA, which I, I, I work in right now, 
I have a little bit more knowledge about, they're really trying to adjust and figure out, okay, how does this fit? I mean, they've already granted um, an opportunity for people that didn't get to play their senior year this year. Softball is major one for us. Um, you have baseball, you also have uh, track and um, golf and tennis. And so all of those sports, they didn't get to play part of their season. And so those girls or men were allowed to have the opportunity to come back. Now that changes things because the schools don't have to have them back for one. Um, and who's going to pay for it? So with all of that to say, a lot of money has been lost. And so a lot of schools are trying to figure out how to make up for those cost loss. Um, is it coming out of scholarship money? Is it coming out of travel money? Is it, unfortunately, some places are dropping programs. Um, on the men's side today, we just had a program get dropped. Um, I know wrestling has had a couple of programs get dropped. So decreasing the amount of money being spent is a real issue right now that I think every athletic department is facing. And depending on the amount of money, um, your school had put into it before depends on how where those um decreases come for the top power fives it's they're not taking chartered flights anymore um for the mid majors it's they're reducing their scholarships and their travel budgets um for other programs it's cutting things and so i think um being realistic and kind of understanding that money is going to be a problem, not only for our individual families, but also for these institutions. And I think this is where being the best student athlete is really going to be important. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's kind of how I see COVID changing the academic and the recruiting process um, moving forward. Okay, so in terms of um, a catch term that has been talked about quite a bit is student athlete experience. And whether it's the NCAA sending out information, whether it's JUCO sending out information, or it's um, NAI programs sending out information, this has been a, a key term. Um, and these are the three main things that we, we kind of talk about when we're talking about the student athlete experience. And in a perfect world, um, this diagram kind of looks like this, or if athletics is super important to you, your athletic one is bigger. If you're academic one, if you're an academic minded person, maybe your academics. Um, and so I think this is a really good thing to think about when you're trying to find a school for a fit. And why I say that is you will see power fives, um, that say, yeah, you're a student athlete, but we're here to win and win at every cost. And um, even, even mid-majors will do this. Um, and so you, you really need to find a good balance because what they'll end up doing is taking and smallering the academic part. They'll smaller the social and athletics will be a bigger piece of the pie. Um, your Ivy Leagues, obviously massive academic schools, so it's almost the exact reverse, right? Their pie grows significantly. Uh, in terms of, for us, the social part is where things, you don't have that time. When I look at my team and what I'm asking them to do, the academics is super important to me, um, and the athletics is super important to me. So where do we take um time from it's from the social you have to be willing to give that up and so as you start to think about your fit start to think about it in these three quadrants and then start to ask coaches when you're around them talking to them hey how much time do you think your student athletes are spending in academics how much is in athletics how much is in social so that you can see does my pit pie fit their pie um, so I, I hope this is a good kind of diagram to help you understand how this can be very different for each student athlete as well as each program. Okay, so I talked about fit. So things to think about when you're talking about the perfect fit. I already talked about this a little bit, but the coach can change. Um, and I went to a school, my 
I, I went to the same school. I had three coaches in my four years, and each one was significantly different than the other. Uh, I went there for a coach. I was recruited in my senior year. They said, oh, yeah, we're staying. We just bought a house. And that was the intended purpose. Life changed. They moved. And I then saw things very differently. Um, so do I think the coach is super important? Yes, because their style will impact you. Um, if you are a very technical player, that is going to be a little bit different than if you're a very physical player. It's also going to be very different if they play a style that's more direct and you're a center midfielder and you want the ball at your feet. Those things don't go together. And who makes that decision? Who makes those decisions? It's the coach and the coaching staff. So do I think they're extremely important in the process? Yes. But they can't be the only reason um, because they can change. The team. I think the girls in our situation and our circumstance are really, really important. Now, that's not to say a team can't change. Coaches can change. Therefore, the team culture can change. A person can leave that held, ev held everything together and then the team culture changes. So understand that it, it might not look like what it looked like. Um, and again, it's not a reason to say, yes, I'm 100% in or no, I'm not in just because of that because they can drastically change. And I'll take our team, for example. Um, when we came in, team culture was not good. The girls didn't like each other. Um, and even the recruits were like, this wasn't really a fun place to be. Now, why did they sign? I'm not really sure about that. But then we as a coaching staff put a lot of time and energy into that. And so our team culture drastically changed. And our whole team now would say we are nothing like what we used to be. Um, and I think that's evident in almost everything that we do. And so for us, it just took a coaching change. Um, for some teams, it'll take a leadership change, right? Like you have really, really good captains. And we see this in high school settings all the time. You have really good leadership on the team. Those people leave and there's a leadership void within the team. So just be aware of that. Um, the academic side of it. Uh, do you know what you want to study? If you don't know what you want to study, that's okay. Don't feel pressured to make decisions based on something you don't know. Um, but is this a place where you can get a degree that can help you continue in your process? Um, whether that's a process that you know or don't know um, can be really important. And then is academic something that you're good at and that comes easy to you? Or is it something that you really struggle with? Because if it's something that you really struggle with, make sure that the place you're going is going to be able to help you. Um, this was a super important part for me and my, my decision. Um, I'm dyslexic and so uh, academics was super tough for me. Um, I always got really good grades because both my parents were academics. And so they said, you will be good there. Um, or you won't play sports. And I was going to play sports because that's what I enjoyed. So I made it work, but I needed a lot of help. And so the school that I chose when I went to college was somewhere that had small classroom sizes. The teachers were really connected. The academics were really connected with the, the um, athletic side of things. So there was really good communication there. And then they had um, a special department for people such as myself to get additional resources. So whether you have a diagnosed learning disability or you just struggle in the classroom, whatever the spectrum is for you, there is a place for you. And don't just go somewhere because it's the right thing to do. Go somewhere because it fits your needs. Um, I think the other two, distance and financial, um kind of speak for themselves if you are a homebody um going all the way across the country might not be a good decision however i will challenge you to get outside your comfort zone you learn a lot in college and if you're constantly going home to spend the weekend with your family are you getting all of those learning opportunities so i will say challenge yourself in these areas um Again, distance could be because of family finances, right? Or um, parents need help uh, because of an illness or something like that. Like there's a lot of reasons that distance or finances could come and be, be something that you have to really concentrate on. 
Um, and then in a time such as this, obviously finances are a, a massive situation for everyone. Um, it's a, a situation for clubs. It's a situation for the NCAA, for institutions. And at the end of the day, it's a situation for each and every one of our families. So the better a student athlete you are, student and athlete, the better person you are, the better resources there are out there for you financially. There's a ton of scholarships available if you will look for them. Um, and so if there's a dream school and it costs a lot of money, don't put yourself in a bad spot. Do the research, see if you can find scholarships um, to supplement some of the costs. So those are just some things to think about there. Um, and, and that kind of leads me into this. And, and those are the questions that you're seeing, hey, are those a good fit? But these are things that I think you need to honestly answer for yourself. And this can't be my mom answered this question for me. This it can't be this is what my parents think or my coach thinks or whatever. Because one of the things, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that I see is a massive discrepancy between what our um, support system wants and what we want. So make sure that you are answering these questions for yourself and not based on what you think you should be answering them. And so again, what do you bring to the table? Um, what are the things that you can brag about yourself with? Uh, and these are the things that you can talk to coaches and emails and phone calls, right? Like it's a time to sell yourself. So think about this. What am I bringing to the table? What are my strengths is a, a way people talk about it. But be really specific. If you're really fast, make sure that you have some times and don't don't exaggerate them we will know it super quick don't don't go doing that but if you're fast and you have fast times list that if you are a goal scorer and you have that ability make sure you have those statistics if you are somebody that is just straight up and, and we'll talk about this as you can see at the bottom of the slide but if you're just someone that's just super gritty and passionate and just going to go after things talk about those things like that is what makes you unique that is what you are trying to sell so make sure you know what you bring to the table the second thing is how do you fit with the culture if the culture is uh ivy league a lot of academics and um the athletic part is is substantial and then the social part is not and you are a social butterfly i don't know if that's the best fit for you so you need to make sure you understand the culture of the school the program and then what culture you bring to the table um and the other thing with that is uh in terms for you is some of those things can change um but make sure and, and change even year to year for you right uh, as a freshman in high school, you, oh yeah, I'm getting a college scholarship and this is awesome and blah, 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 blah. And then by your senior year, you're burnt out and you don't want to be there. Jumping into a power five or a program that's demanding a ton of um, athletic responsibility from you isn't going to make anybody happy. It's definitely not going to make you happy. You're going to be frustrated. It's not going to make the coaches happy. They're going to be frustrated. And then it's just this really bad situation that people start to transfer in. So really important to kind of even reevaluate this year to year in your recruiting process. Does that culture fit with where I am in my life? And then where do you want to go with soccer? If playing after soccer, I mean, playing after college is something that is super important to you, make sure that that is something that the coaches know, or if that is something that is important to you, how can they help you get there? If that's not something important to you, that's okay too, but make sure you want to know where you're going with soccer. And I say this because so much of this next one happens all the time was a college scholarship the end destination if that is the scenario you think then college soccer is not for you if you have worked all this time just to get a college scholarship then college soccer is not for you for one because college soccer is a new journey a new destination and has a lot of extra work put into it so if the end destination was a college scholarship you can get a lot of college scholarships 
that don't require you to split your time into three. You can do it in academics and social. You can play sports with club sports and stuff like that. So really start to think about this. Is college scholarship, an athletic college scholarship, the reason I'm still doing this? And if that's the answer, then really start to think about that. Have an honest conversation with your parents and your coaches. And then why do I wanna play college soccer? Is it because of pride? Is it because I don't wanna give this up? Is it because I enjoy the sport? Is it because of the money? Um, really kind of identify why you wanna play college soccer and so that you can have those honest conversations with yourself, your parents, your coaches, and then ultimately the college that you're, you're being recruited by and in the process with. And the last thing I think you need to really answer honestly is kind of coming back to this grit is college soccer is one of the most gritty things you'll have to do because it's not fun at all a lot of the time now can it be a lot of fun a lot of the time yep but there are going to be 6 a.m practices there are going to be late nights there are going to be times when you can't go out with people because you have to get up early or you're going to have to make hard decisions of not going to somebody's um, birthday or a wedding of a friend because you have obligations. These are things you need to think about now. Is your passion for soccer, which requires your effort and your energy, is it great enough to push you past some of those things? Now, if you would say, hey, I really like college soccer, but it's not one of the most important things, that's another reason to kind of look at some of those other divisions and options and opportunities because each one requires something different. And then are you willing to persevere? Because you might be the best player on your team now or in your situation now, but you won't be. Um, and maybe you're lucky enough to be the best player then and you get to college and you're still the best player, but the expectations will change and it is a hard grind. Um, and so I think if you don't accept that now, um, or understand that now, I think this can be a really tough, tough time for some people. Okay, so a lot was covered in that. These were some slides I added in um, when Gareth kind of talked to me about some of your questions that you guys sent in. So I wanted to kind of give you a visual with this um, so that you could kind of see it uh, before we kind of dive into questions. But you guys talked a lot about um, contact and recruiting contact, whether it's emails, phone call, or in-person conversations. And so here's some just general things um, that I, some ideas that I threw out. Um, obviously, you're going to have your introduction emails. Really important is to list your name and your grad year. Make sure that those are super highlighted because, again, grad year is becoming such a big deal. If you don't put it, then we don't know if we can contact you. And depending on our uh, institutions, they might say you can't contact those people at all. Sorry, I had the hiccup. Um, so make sure that's on there. Why are you interested in the school? Don't just send blanket emails saying, well, you had a record of seven and two, and I think you are a really good competitive team for me. And well, like, those are some good details, you could have just looked up my record, put seven and two, and then had the same email the rest of the time. So really think about these things, like what's gonna catch our interest? Have you watched one of our games? Did you go to a game or see something that caught your interest? Has this been a school that your parents or your grandparents have gone to? Is this a school that as a fifth grader, you did a book report on this school and, ever since, like you've had the poster hanging in your, your room. Like, why are you interested in this school? And really kind of dive into that a little bit. It doesn't have to be your whole life story. Keep it short and sweet. Um, but it's really important to, hey, why, why is this important? Why is this important to them? Um, and then again, brag about yourself a little bit. What stands out and, and that sort of thing. And, and so, what are their needs? Do you see, did you look up their roster and are you a goalkeeper and you see you're graduating, you're starting goalkeeper in this year. And uh, I think I might be a really good fit because they are this, this, and this, and I fit those needs. Um, start to do your research about them and see why 
um, you might be a good fit. Uh, when you're sending out tournament emails, make sure you send out the correct schedule. If the schedule gets updated, send out a re-updated schedule. The field, the time, the location, the color. If you're a goalkeeper, what half are you playing in? Um, the other important thing is it's always good to put the coach's contact information um, just in case for whatever reason they can't reach out to you, they can maybe reach out to your contact, I mean your coach's contact information. Um, if you're sending out film emails, again, instruction on how to get to the film. Like if it's encrypted, you need a password. Make sure that when I would suggest sending out test emails to make sure your links work um, to see how people can get into them. Just some, some thoughts there because college coaches are getting a lot of those and they're not gonna, unless there's something that super catches their eye, they're not gonna really dive into it until they know why they should. Um, and then why do you think um, they should look at this and what are they looking for? Hey, in the first couple of clips, you'll see me, my ability to finish, or you'll see my grit and hard work in terms of my slide tackles or defensive. Like what's, what's you, what are you good at and where can they find that? Um, and then here's a really important one. Put your best clips first. Don't just go through a game and cut the game up and these are the clips and then show me you making an okay pass when at the end of the game, you made a shot from 50 yards out to be the game winner. Like I want to see that first because that's going to grab my attention, right? So the attention grabbing clips in the beginning and then um kind of go from there and it's not to say you making an okay pass isn't something a coach wants to see they want to see you be able to do the difficult and the mundane all at the same time but what's going to grab their attention why should they watch for the next three to five minutes um make sure you put your coach's contact information again and then here's another one highlight versus full, full game send out the highlights first with a catchy first couple of clips to see and then be able to have a full game for them to see um, because if they aren't able to get to one of your games you want to be able to show them this is who I am and not just one game maybe one or two games and again this is another good option for people that aren't able to get to some of the bigger tournaments or you're not playing in some of the different clubs um, or, or programs whether it be ESNL DA is now kind of phasing itself out. Um, but if you're not able to play in that leagues, those leagues, um, find other ways to get yourself out there. Because if you are a good player, um, coaches will want you. It doesn't matter if you play for um, the hooligans, if you are gonna change their team, they will find a way to make sure that they are making an effort. Um, and then this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, um, but put the right coach and school in your emails. The mass emails, like a template is fine. I use templates all the time. Use a template, but make sure that you're saying, hey, okay, now I'm writing to um, the school of wherever and I make sure that I have the right coaches information in there. I have the right schedule. I have the right information about each program because it will make life so much easier and you will have the connections that you want instead of no connections and a ton of emails sent out. Okay, going into phone calls. Here is where I would say as a society, we love to send an email, we love to send a text, and we've gotten away from making phone calls. If a coach hasn't reached out to you, or you have sent a lot of emails and haven't heard from them, or you saw that they were at a game and haven't heard from them, reach out to them via phone call. I know it's a scary idea, but it will be the best. And here's why. For one, it shows that you really do care, Two, it shows that you have the initiative to pick up the phone and put yourself in a tough situation. And for three, you'll get the answers to your questions in a timely manner. We get a lot of emails. 
So sometimes they get put in a box to say, okay, I need to come back to this. If you want information, get information. The other thing is, it's a really good way if they have a camp or um, a questionnaire to ask for those things. Hey, I, uh, I know I'm only a freshman or a sophomore, super interested in you guys, know you can't talk to me right now. Is there a place that I can find your camp information and your uh, questionnaire? And here's the thing, yes, you can find all those things online by just a simple Google search, right? But you put your name out there. You say, hey, I'm interested in you. It's more than just an email that they get 500 of. So just a, a tidbit there. Have a few questions. Once you're of recruiting age, um, depending on where you are, have a few questions. It doesn't have to be a lot and it doesn't have to be super over the top. Um, but just make it something um, so that you can, can have a conversation and be able to ask about um some things for them um and then the last thing that uh i would say is take notes after um and this is still a habit that i'm getting used to as a college coach but i think um if i would have learned it earlier in my life it would have been super helpful is if i just jot down susie uh act next tuesday and um going to such and such tournament or uh, parents are struggling financially, like whatever sticks out to me about that conversation that when I go back to call Susie, I can say, oh, how are your parents doing? Are, are, are you able, were they able to find a job? And so then it becomes more personal, right? Um, so make sure to take just a few notes, doesn't have to be a lot, um, but something that helps you remember about that conversation and makes them understand, yeah, you you were super into this. Um, and then in-person conversations. Again, if you see a school that you like um, and they're at one of your games, after the game, go up and introduce yourself. Go up and say hi. Don't keep walking past people that you might be able to say hey to. Um, and, and a firm handshake or just get down on their level if they're sitting in the chair. Um, but just be like, hey, didn't mean to take too much of your time, but really interested in your school and thanks for coming to watch me. Um, my next game is blah, 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 blah. Great. We just keep it moving. But now they put a face with a number and are able to see all of that. The other thing that I would say is when you're in these situations, I know it's really easy to look down or look to the side or whatever, but really try to look them in the eye. If you can't look them in the eye, look them directly in the nose. Um, they won't know the difference. So hopefully that'll, that'll help you a little bit there. Okay, some of your other questions, uh, a lot of them kind of related to, to the timeline. And I think it's gonna be super important to really talk about this. Each school will be a little bit unique and a little bit different depending on um, standards and guidelines and rules and regulations, um, this will be unique because for the really academic schools, they're starting this process even early, even though the athletic part isn't as much there. So making sure what the requirements are for each school that you're interested in is going to be really important. Okay, in our freshman and our sophomore year, I put this as the number one, become the best player you can be. If you are the best player, you will get recruited. That's plain and simple. Like, I don't mean to say it any other way. If you are going to change a program, you will get recruited and the rest will fall into place. So become the best player you can be. Right underneath that, I put become the best person you can be. Um, and I think it's super important for this is not to say that becoming the best player is better than becoming the best person because I think being the best person is, is definitely more important. Um, but I do think that this is a really important thing to think about, whether it's academics, whether it's what you're involved in. Um, all of those things may not be the reason they initially chose you, because let's be honest, they see you in a game, you're, they're like, hey, I like that kid. What is about that kid, right? And they've said that at seven other games. So you caught their eye because you were the best player, but now being the best person 
keeps their attention? Do you have the GPA they need? Do you have some of the extracurriculars? If they're looking at two identical players, what's going to separate you? And that's being the best person that you can be. Um, and then be comfortable in communicating with people outside your comfort zone. So if communicating, if picking up the phone your junior year sounds scary, start practicing in your freshman and your sophomore year. If having a firm handshake is something that you need to work on, if looking somebody in the eye, all of those things you can start to do right now so that when that time comes, it's not scary for you anymore, it's second nature. So again, freshman and sophomore years, becoming the best version of you, working on the things outside of your comfort zone so that when in your sophomore, junior, and senior year, those become habits. Sophomore year, um, I suggest that you start going to the ID camps that you're super interested in. ID camps are really beneficial. I have, can't tell you on two hands more than that, how many kids I've recruited was either on the fence about, didn't know about, or whatever from ID camps. Now, is that every kid? Nope, sure isn't. But it is a great opportunity because you get an opportunity not only to show them personally what you're about, but also to interact with them, to see um, the school, to be able to see the players if they, they're able to be there. All of those different little unique things that maybe you don't get on a telephone call or an email. I think they can be really, really important. Emails, they can't reach back to you unless you're talking about uh, finding a questionnaire or getting more information about camp. So if you want response back, that's the best way to go. Ask those things in there so that they can send that back to you. Um, however, it's not to say that sending out emails to these people before tournaments, hey, I have been really interested in your school for blah, 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 blah reasons and I'm playing in this showcase and here's my information. Because they're going to be recruiting you right now. They're going to be watching you if you're somebody of interest. So make the, that information available and easy to them, but make sure you in, also include your coach's information so that there's somebody that they can reach out to. And then it's also a way to get them to your games, right? So making sure that you're being seen in your sophomore year. Okay, going into your junior year, all of the above matters, right? And you can see on the other side that it's a stepping stair system. Um, the bottom level is kind of um, before high school starts, and then you have your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. You could even, before that, it could be your, like your sophomore, junior, senior, and then going into college because each level requires you to build on the last. So with that being said, um, once you've kind of put your name out there in your sophomore year, see who contacts you again. Like reach out to them. Are they now emailing you back? Or do they want to see your game film? Like what are their thoughts on who you are and where they are? you are in their program? And then if you've miscalculated, that's okay. This is a great time to readjust. Um, kind of say, okay, these were the schools that I thought would really be interested in me. They're not. Don't, don't hold on to it. Cut the losses and find the people that want you because when you feel wanted, you will survive and you will thrive. So make sure that you're in a place um, for that. And that's not to say don't continue to go after your dream school even after they told you no. Um, I'm all about the underdog, but I would also significantly um, increase your chances of finding the perfect fit if you then broaden your, your spectrum and, and readjust some of your thinking. Start to make phone calls. Start to figure out who am I going to go on official visits with? Who am I going to go on unofficial visits with? Remember, you only have five. Watch their game film. Why do you fit for them? If they are a long ball team and you are a crafty midfielder, that is not a good fit for you. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe it, it is for different reasons. But if you want the ball at your feet and they continue to go over the midfield, let's find a different school that will find your feet where you're a good fit. So watch their game film. See what 
what you can pull out of it and then have conversations with those coaches. I can't tell you anything more than I love the recruits that call me and they're like, Hey, I watched this and I saw how this player was doing this. I, I didn't really understand. Can you talk to me a little bit more about this? Or I saw how they were doing this and that's something that I do. And it was super successful for them. And I think that could be super successful for me too. So have something to talk to the, the coaches about. This is when ID camps can really make or break you, right? You can go to them and, and make sure you're narrowing it down at this point, but make sure you're going to the ones where you, the coach knows you, who, who are you and who, what are you about? So make sure that you're kind of there. And then connect with the team members, whether it's on social media or academics, like see, hey, what are they doing? Is this something that it looks like it would be interesting to me? The thing with social media is it's always our best clips, right? Very rarely are they putting the not fun 6 a.m.s where they just don't want to be there and this is hard. So take it with a grain of salt, but always reach out to the academics, the team members, and anybody else associated with the program to answer questions. Um, it could be really important to ac ask about the athletic trainer and the medical situation. Um, if you've had injuries or um, have a health concern, like those are things that you need to start to think about and contacting those people. And then in your senior year, narrowing the process, right? <clears throat> <coughs> sorry about that starting to make your final decision and then be proud of your decision so often girls start to hide things like that and so be proud of it tag your school be proud that this is who who you are and, and where you're going um it's fun for them and it's fun for the coaches to know that you're that excited and then it's just exciting time for you and you should really um, be proud of it and want to be there because that's the first sign that you're going to thrive in a, in a location. Um, and then this is kind of my last thing to kind of tie this all up, but become, you were becoming your best soccer player, right? Your freshman year. And now you need to become a better soccer player because really this staircase on the right is now starting all over again. You are now entering the bottom level again, and you are going to have to climb your way to the top. And so it, you need to make sure you're a better soccer player. And that's not to say that you won't get the playing time or whatever. I think those are important conversations to have, but this is a whole new experience and you're going to have to climb the ladder. So those are just some things to think about when you're talking about your timeline. Okay, whew, lot of information to cover there. Uh, I think in terms for me, the things that I see players missing is people are way too worried about the prestige than the fit. Um, and they're letting their pride get in the way. Uh, so many people are on the transfer portal. So many people are having to do this again because they didn't get it right the first time. And that's not to say that that's not an option, but you don't want to be doing this process again. Um, so don't let your pride get in the way. People aren't doing their research. Again, we talked about this. They don't know what the program's about. They don't know what the academic standards are. They're just throwing it out there and hoping something sticks. So do your research. Um, thinking you have reached the top once you have a scholarship. And again, we have this conversation with a lot of players. Like you will be significantly unhappy if the only reason you attend a school is because of the ac athletic scholarship. It, it just won't work. Um, no matter what level you're at. And so make sure that once you've gotten the scholarship, you're ready for that next level of commitment. Um, and then kind of the mental side of things. This has become a huge issue all over um, the country. And it's one of the main reasons I started uh, an Instagram page and you can see it there. But the, the information we're putting into our minds needs to be able to overcome some of the situations. So make sure that you're investing in what, what are you scrolling through? What are, what are you putting into your mind's eye? What information is staying in there that you can come back to when things get tough that you can pull up and say, oh, no, I learned and I can remember that I have overcome my best days, my best worst days, I have overcome those and I'm, I'm an overcomer. 
Like, what are we putting in our mind? So whether it's what you're flipping through on Instagram or social media or what books you're reading or what TV shows you're listening to or what me, uh, music you're listening to, like make sure you're putting good things in, in, in your mind's eye. And then your support system. It will change when you get to college, right? Um, your support system in high school will be different than it will be in college. And I think growing up with your support system, right? You're not gonna have your mom and your dad call your boss. So I would recommend you start to put those boundaries in place when they get to call, when you get to college, laying those things out. Hey, this is the next level of maturity for me. And so this is what I need you guys to help me with. This is what I need your support to look like. And then these are the things that I'm going to have to overcome and have some difficult conversations. What are things that you aren't good at, but you need to be better at to be a mature adult? And then start to use college as an opportunity to do that. Um, because it, it can be one of the greatest learning at curves we can have, or we can get out of college and not have learned anything socially between when we went four years ago and now, and then we hit the real world and it, it really doesn't look good. So make sure that this is another opportunity for both your support system and yourself to grow up and start to take the next responsibility. So those are some of the things that I have seen in terms um, as a college coach over the last couple of years that are that are missing in our thing. So I'm going to open it up now again to you, um, Gareth, and we can answer any other questions that maybe you guys had. That's awesome, Kat. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do that and for sharing that with us. Uh, so we have a few questions that some of our players have, have uh, sent in and, and we're going to share some of those and hopefully you can answer them. I, I think a lot of them you've already answered. So they've been done in the, in the presentation, which was so full of excellent details. But uh, here's the, the first question that we have is how often should we email coaches and what time of the year should we email coaches? Is there certain times when we should or we should not email coaches? Yeah, great question. Um, so how often should you email them and then uh, what time of the year. So I think that's going to really vary depending on the school um, because there will be programs that have um, recruiting coordinators that are specifically designated to that task all year long. And they can really dive into that, whether they're in the middle of the season or in the summer or whatever. And that's really something that is on their radar all the time. Now you're going to have other programs where there's a head coach and then assistants or GAs and they don't have time during the season to reach back out to every single email. So I think the most important thing is if you need answers or you want more answers, email is not the way to go. It's a phone call. It's actually kind of braving up and saying, okay, this is an uncomfortable situation for me, but I'm going to make a phone call because I would like to actually see, hey, are they super interested? Is this not a good time? Like if you're not getting the answers you want through email, give them a call. Um, so that's, that's the first part is being okay with being uncomfortable, like going outside of our comfort zone with that. And then I think the second thing with that is um, ask them, right? hey, what is a good time for me to call you? If they train in the morning and their whole evenings are off, great, when's a good time? If they're training in the evenings and they have some time in the mornings when you have a free period, maybe that's a good time to call. So really being specific, like I can't give you a blanket because it's not a blanket answer. It's gonna be different for each coaching staff and each program um, in what it is. So. The best thing is to ask that question to the coaches that you really want to talk to. Awesome, awesome. Uh, next question was, and you rate, weighed into this a little bit, but maybe you can kind of clarify even further, how much do academics and grades weigh into a coach's decision when you're recruiting players and you're looking at players? Yeah, I think a couple of things. If you're looking at an Ivy League school or somebody with high, high academics, they're not looking at how good of a soccer player you are until you can get into their school, right? So I think that will have a little bit to do with it. Um, but at the same time, if 
with now, hey, there's a forward and you're both the same. Like you can both come in and you can do the same job and we're really excited about both of you. Okay, now what separates you? Is it the academics? Is it the, your ability to do things in um, the community? Like what is it that takes you to the next level? So academics can separate you from somebody that's equal to you. The other thing academics can do is, especially right now, is financially. There's a ton more academic money at most institutions than there ever will be athletic money. And so if finances is something that could be an issue for you guys, um, you can't say, oh, I'm counting on an, a full ride. In college soccer, very rarely does a full ride occur. Um, now, people can say, yeah, you have a full ride and mix it with this and that and this and say, oh yeah, it's a full ride now that you have 20% um, athletic or 80% academic or however that mat matches. Um, but it, it cannot hurt you to be a good student. Like it will only improve your, your, your odds. If you put all of your eggs in one basket and you drop the basket, that's a problem, right? If you have kind of taken things in different areas and you're really good at one or two things outside of soccer, now, now that somebody, especially for a coach like myself, who wants well-rounded individuals, like I'm here to mature and help young women grow, um, and that's going to be different for every coach. But for me, I'm looking for those people that understand, okay, I need to be good at a lot of different things. Awesome. Uh, next question was about ECNL and DA programs. And, and this particular player said that, um, so a couple of different players actually said, ECNL and DA programs that are close to me are not something my parents can make happen because uh, of their work schedules or finances or travel, whatever it may be. Uh, they said, what is their recommendation for getting noticed if you don't have access to these type of large showcases? Yeah, and, and that's a really good question because there's a lot of people in that boat. Um, and I think there will probably even be a few more now that kind of DA and some other things are kind of not known at the moment. And so I think there will be even more people with financial situations that clubs are going to help try to help, but there are people that are losing their jobs and you playing club soccer is not going to be more important than turning the lights on at the end of the day. Like, and I think so, I think that's a really good question, especially in this time and age and what I would say is do what you can do. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if it's um, being able to go out and referee two or three games and then use that money to help buy somebody come out and record, professionally record your games for two or three games, you just earn the money yourself to do that and you're not putting a burden on your family to ask them for more money, you now have the resource when a coach asks, okay, so you can't, I can't see you here. Do you have footage for me? Yes, I do. And it's not my dad over there like, yay, every time you score a goal or um, the parent conversation that I don't need to hear. Um, and so I think it, for one, it's going to take a little bit of responsibility from yourself to say, okay, this is important to me. Um, it's, it's not something my parents can provide right now. So how can I step in? How can I earn a little bit of extra money so that I can have somebody do this for me? And if that's not an option, like there's a ton of other options, but I think it's thinking outside the box because once you have some of those resources, whether it's a clip, like a, a, a highlight clip in your game film, you can really send that out to anybody. And if you catch somebody's eye, if you're good enough, like I said, if you're good enough, they'll be interested. Like if you're doing things that they're like, I need that in my program, they will find a way either to get you to their ID camps, they will find a way to help you or get to a 
like something else or they'll take a risk. Like if you're that good, they'll take a risk. And so I think it's really starting to think outside the boxes in, in how we handle this. Um, and if you're part of the ODP program, maybe it's something um, that you're kind of talking with your ODP coaches. Hey, I don't see a lot of good competition in some other things. Can I get a game here filmed or can um, you help me with some of that? Like use the resources within um, the programs that you have um, and just think outside the box a little bit. And, and kind of following on from that, some of our players asked about they're in a small town where maybe they're playing for a small club and they don't have access to a showcase or they don't have access to, um, you know, high level games uh, consistently and they're just playing high school at maybe a smaller high school. How do they help themselves get noticed? Is it very similar? Yeah, I'd say it's really similar. But I think the other thing is we sometimes disconnect count JUCOs, right? And that's what they were developed for, um, is the player that for whatever reason hasn't been seen or doesn't have the grades. And you can be a non-qualifier or a qualifier going into a JUCO. And so what that means is if you go into a JUCO as a qualifier, so you've gone through the entire NCAA uh, eligibility center, and they say you could play at an NCAA one school right now, that means you're a qualifier. So you don't have to stay for the whole ye two years at the JUCO and graduate from them. You as a qualifier can use that year to get the game film that you need, to get the competition that you need and go to the next location. I think it's something that's overlooked a lot, like, oh, I didn't get somewhere. Well, it's okay to take another step. Um, and I think that sometimes is something that we overlook um, because it's, it's not the traditional way or it's it's not the pride like it's pride that I, I think pride comes into a lot of recruiting issues um but I think it's just being like okay this is going to be my next step and that's fine like I could play for a national championship at a juco and go to a college and have a great opportunity and expectation so I, I think JUCOs are a really good option for some uh, some people for whatever reason they're not seen because of their location or their clubs um, or or injuries or whatever whatever it might be. I think um, that is another good option outside of just your traditional recruiting in high school. Great advice. Uh, last question: uh, What catches your attention, or what do you look for in a highlight video? If you're a goalkeeper or you're a defender, a midfielder, a forward, are there certain things you want to see positionally when you're looking at, at highlight videos? I'm really bad at goalkeeper ones. Super bad. That's probably why I have a goalkeeper coach on my staff because I'm like, they they look like they keep the ball out of the back of the net. Um, that's, that's what I want. Um, but so I don't know if I can talk to you about goalkeepers as much, but I think the thing for me is – I don't need to see you like grab my attention, like whatever you're good at. So as a player, I was not the most tactical. Um, I for sure wasn't the most technical, but I would freaking run through you and I would slaughter you. And that's how I made it to division one. They were like, you're fast and you freaking get up every time you knock somebody down seven times your size. And that's, that's what did it. Like, that's how I got to college. Um, and I kind of probably have some of the same attitude as a coach. Like, I'm like, I, I, there could be an easier way. There could be a way to open a door and go through a, a wall that way. But I just am like, let's go through. But that's just my personality. That's who I am. And so if I was creating a highlight video for me, the first two clips are me freaking slide tackling somebody or challenging somebody that's like, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. So if you're a ball winner, like put the ball winning skills in there. If you're a goal scorer, put the goal scoring things. If you're really good tactically or technically, like show that in those clips, like whatever you are like, hey, I'm good at this. This is what I'm good at. Like show that. That's what we want to see. Um, and then we'll, we'll ask the rest of the questions to be like, well, okay, so you can do a Maradona, but can you connect a pass after the Maradona? Or you can score goals, but are you able to athletically make it from 
path to the the 18 to be able to score goals. So we'll ask those other questions, but show us what you're good at. Awesome advice. Kat, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for coming on today and, and sharing this time with us and, and uh, sharing your expertise and, and sharing your knowledge of, of recruiting with our players. Um, I'm sure players throughout South Texas will take great value from this. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And let me real quick, here's all of my contact information. Again, yeah. um, I have no problem emailing you or IG or whatever. Um, I, I'm here for, for you guys. And, and again, I will say in the title line, put something about recruiting 101 conversation or something like that. Um, because if it is a recruiting email, it just automatically gets sent to my recruiting coordinator. Um, so if you don't kind of distinguish for me right away, like I probably won't see it. So I want to make sure I answer your questions. And if you have any thoughts or, or things like that, I would, I would love to hear about it. Awesome. Thank you again, Kat. No problem. Have a good one. Have a good one, everyone.